Hello, everybody. My name is Spencer Walsh. Welcome to today's show. Thank you so much for joining us here today on this episode of Newsflash. It's a little bit different on the show today because we have primarily for you today just clips. We have clips from really important stories uh, all across the world instead of articles, which I think will be you know definitely an interesting change to try out. But we're going to start with the general updates on the Israel-Hamas war. Uh, more specifically, the continued war on Gaza and the conflicting narratives coming out of the two biggest supporters of that war, being Israel and the United States. Um, also, we will take a look at the continuing spree of horrific news massacres coming out of various parts of both Gaza and the West Bank, uh, including the storming of a hospital in the south of Gaza. Also, a first report from a Western journalist will tell you uh, how fair it was from Gaza with uh, this Clarissa Ward of CNN going in with the Emirati medical team. A really horrific story coming out of a Gaza UN school. And uh, we will end the show with a very interesting uh, explanation from the head of Israeli security about why October 7th happened and a really, really horrific deal being considered by Biden that should, on top of all the other things, really make you consider. And this is something that we're going to be bringing up uh, throughout the show, why Biden would be so undesirable come 2024. Um, yeah, because it's just like, it's the, all the people out there who are just expecting you know, me, you know, or anybody else, just the, like the outrage, the indignation that we are just presented with on a daily basis. Like it is just like they expect, you know, me or it feels like, you know, a lot of people, uh, just the general attitude of people that I talk to, uh, you know, in largely democratic circles, um, they're just expecting me to just really like I buy you know, I guess knowing them by having the experiences I had, by being someone who is, you know, I guess interested in politics, somebody who just has to put aside, uh, you know, all my values and vote for Joe Biden when he's doing things like what's going on in, um, in, in Gaza right now. I just, I cannot for the life of me wrap my head around it. And I do hope we will have some sort of a discussion on it soon uh, with somebody who thinks differently than me, because that's always fun. Uh, but anyway... Uh, we have to start with the latest updates here on this war as uh, U.S. President uh, has apparently, you know, it's really interesting Joe Biden what he's doing here. He's putting out all these headlines, which is very, very convenient come, you know, when he's losing all the support. He's down by 10 points a year out from the election in Michigan, which is, you know, te- you know, 11 months is a lot for 10 points in a state like Michigan. I will say that right now. You know, I'm no uh, elections expert, but I do happen to know more about it. Uh, and have studied it probably more than the average person off the street. So I can tell you that it is going to be a really, really uphill battle. And I think it's absolutely obvious that if the election were held today, Joe Biden would lose quite convincingly. Um, and so what he's decided to do here clearly is to go on the offensive, at least on a public relations standpoint. And what, how he's decided to do that is by tricking the American people into thinking that he's, you know, really starting to get t- uh, talking tough when it comes to um, Israel, and when it comes to trying to get people to shorten the war, uh, there was a. I woke up to a few days ago notification um, that he was saying something along the lines of they're losing support for their war. They're going to have to rein it in soon. They can't continue uh, like the way they are now. Uh, but then, less reported is later down, uh, later down in that you know speech that I think he was giving at a fundraiser. He essentially turns around and says. You know, we need to get them to, you know, a good solution. You know, they do need to rein it in. But until they do, you know, we're going to support them 100%. So he can't even finish a speech. And by the way, yeah, his aides were asked about that. They were after after they were just like, you know, is this going to be one of the, you know, other million Biden walkbacks? And they're like, well, you know, he was just random remarks. You know, you know how it is. Wink, wink, random remarks. Uh, It was a great euphemism there. Uh, kind of does take you back to the times of Donald Trump there as well with the uh, various euphemisms his aides had to do to employ to describe his conduct. Um, you know, so that is that is another thing that you know we have to look forward to in 2024. But he's putting out you know all these stories about oh yeah he's sending Jake Sullivan 
to come in and you know talk tough. We'll, we'll take a look at how that go. That's going to go in the minute. Um, meanwhile, Palestinian telecommunications firms say that services have been cut in Gaza once again due, due to Israeli attacks. Uh, the Gaza government media office says communications blackouts have hampered rescue efforts. Uh, they have also, Israel has concluded a 60-hour raid in Jenin in the West Bank, which, by the way, no one is talking about. No one's asking any questions about what the hell uh, Israel is doing in the West Bank right now. You know, what, are they doing anything to put, you know, the, the hold on settlers? Are they trying to condemn settlers in any way? And, you know, the West certainly isn't pushing them to do so. No, what they're doing in the West Bank is they're further raiding people. They're further, you know, inflaming tensions and violence and really without any sort of logical explanation as to what they're doing. They're not, you know, put, you know, putting anything up um, as a justification, uh, which is really, really, I think, remarkable. Um, so, yeah, it's we're going to go through some of the other, you know, stuff here. Uh, Israeli troops uh, and tanks have raided a Gaza hospital. Um, used, uh, went and employed ill treatment of patients, staff, and displaced people, according to the U.N., uh, and we'll get to their conduct in a minute, you know, backing up, a, you know, a broader report. Um, but, yeah, this it comes in the context of you know, this lower intensity war that Biden is pushing um, and and strikes continue to hit southern Gaza. Um, Al Jazeera's fact checking unit, Sanad, uh, verified a video showing flares lighting up the skies of southern Gaza's Khan Yunus amid another night of intense strikes. So, flare bombs, highly flammable, and toxic materials have been used to eliminate areas being targeted by strikes, um, which is, it's really, you know, not only just the explosion, but also the toxic materials, at least, is, you know, very in, uh, important. Um, so, since the conflict in, uh, began on October 7th, Israel has regularly fired uh, uh, fired flares over Gaza, typically followed by deadly air attacks. Earlier, a Israeli strike targeted an area in Khan Yunis, reportedly hitting the the home of, excuse me, of the Abu Nasser family, resulting in destruction and casualties on the ground. Um, yeah, so that, and, you know, those casualties we have found out more, but meanwhile, though, they've also bombed the Kuwaiti hospital in southern Gaza's Rafah area, resulting in multiple casualties, the Palestinian news agency Wafa reported. Um, a video posted on social media by Al Jazeera Arabic showed a massive explosion in the vicinity of the hospital, um, with injured people rescued from the rubble being transferred to Abu Yusuf al Najjar Hospital in Rafah. Wafa, Rafa, Wafa said, Wafa, the news agency. Uh, Israel forces overnight also bombed residential neighborhoods and homes in Deir al-Bala in Gaza City, as well as Nusrat and Jabal refugee camps. So uh, information on casualties from the attacks uh, were not immediately available. And as we're recording this, it's just about the, you know, midnight on Friday. So the night has just finished in Gaza. So we are really seeing all the casualties starting to pour in from the night before, of course, with the increasingly poor um, internet connection in Gaza, so I think it's important to put that out there. Um, so here is the Janine report. Uh, this is pretty important to bring you here. This is our first video of many. Let's roll the tape. Uh, this is Al Jazeera report on the 11 Palestinians killed Tuesday in Janine and how they are feeling there post, and I think this is very interesting, post the 60-hour raid. And again, no one's asking about this. No one's putting any explanation up for why this is happening. But 60 hour raid in Janine. So here it is. Armored vehicles, weaponized drones, bulldozers, and at least 1,400 Israeli reservist soldiers were involved. This is they from surrounded Al Jazeera. and sealed off the refugee camp inside Janine City, hunting suspected members of the Palestinian armed resistance. Tens of thousands of Palestinian civilians were trapped inside their besieged homes for around 60 hours. They came and took my husband and they threatened us in the kitchen. They destroyed the room where we were sitting. They asked us not to shut the door and to keep it open because they might come back. After breaking down doors, soldiers ransacked Palestinian homes. They came at night. Look what they have done to the house. It's just a Doing it just because. It just because. It's just their hatred toward us. It's but we're not afraid of them. Janine will always embrace the heroes of the resistance. We will not let our people down. After surrounding Janine's main hospitals, the Israeli army stopped and detained ambulance teams trying to reach the wounded. The Israeli military released footage, it says, 
shows confiscated weapons and improvised explosive devices. And this is a report from uh, this is a report that's been confirmed by you know international doctor or doctor Medicine Sans Frontier. I believe it was a report uh, confirmed this report that there was an ambulance blockage going on the West Bank, which is a time honored practice that we've heard time countless times. Uh, you know, well, also well before this conflict of ambulances being blocked there. Uh, so nothing new from Israel. But then, of course, we have these, you know, apparently three, you know, shitty ass explosives that were worth, you know, turning the entire city into lockdown and just destroying people's property for. Vices. And this video has caused shock and anger across Palestine. It appeared on social media and shows an Israeli soldier praying at the pulpit inside a Janine mosque. He is reciting a Jewish prayer which rings out across the camp as Palestinians hide trapped in their homes. And by the way, that may not seem to people, you know, even pro-Palestinian people who are, you know, Western support, you know, people in the West who may just be like, you know, free Palestine and all this stuff. But again, this is deeply, deeply religious, but both of them, deeply, deeply religious populations. They know exactly what they're doing. They know the level of excitement that is, and it is much bigger uh, than anyone who's, you know, the vast majority of, you know, the atheist leftist supporting Palestine could imagine. It is a really strong cultural incitement, um, you know, especially these people are trapped in the vicinity, having to listen to this kind of Jewish prayer, this taunting uh, in the vicinity. Despite some calls for the soldier to be punished inside Israel, Minister of National Security Itamar bin Givir tweeted, There is he has no been punished according to the IDF. ...against fighters who give their lives for the people of Israel in the heart of hell in Janine. This picture shows graffiti sprayed by Israeli soldiers on the wall of a mosque. It reads, We came here to eat hummus. Another indication, perhaps, uh, that Israeli soldiers can act with complete impunity or without fear of being held to account. And those uh, cell phones, by the way, they're not getting taken away anytime soon. It's More videos will be coming out like this on the regular. The Israeli army came here three days ago and they kept sending reinforcements, but as you can see, our situation is better than our people in Gaza. This house they destroyed is nothing. It is one of the many sacrifices we are ready to give for the sake of our fallen in Gaza. The by the way, West Bank, incredibly more radical class since October 7th, which by the way, not good for Israel, especially Israeli settlers. The Israeli army is one that has no humanity, no respect. The Palestinian Prisoner Association says hundreds of Palestinians were arrested. Many were detained and released after hours of interrogation. As night fell, thousands came out from their homes, filling the streets in funeral processions as families, friends and a shattered community buried their dead. Since the war started on October the 7th... All right, so there is the reporting there from Janine. Let's go on to our next story. This is kind of continuing uh, back and forth uh, between, um, so again, we got, let's just go quickly through here some more. Uh, Israel demolishing a Palestinian home near Nablus. Um, you know, meanwhile, we have some Gaza ceasefire protests held in eight major U.S. cities. Uh, Jewish protesters blocking rush hour traffic in Boston, Philly, and D.C. Um, demonstrations also occurred in Atlanta, Chicago, Minneapolis, Seattle, and Portland, Oregon. Um, as we continue to see, again, more strikes in Rafa. France saying it's working to get its journalists out of Gaza at the moment. I don't know why. Um, or I guess maybe there's some, I don't even know. don't really care, but this is not really a relevant story. Um, Israeli military recovers also the body of a captive from Gaza, which is interesting. Um, after an identification process conducted by medical officials and military rabbi and the Institute of Forensic Medicine, along with the police, the body was confirmed to be that of captive Elia Toledano, who was taken hostage by Hamas on October 7th. Be interesting to see how she ended up passing away. Um, and those are some of the just general latest updates. But the big story coming out of all this is, and we're seeing the, the headlines from Biden nonstop, oh, you know, Israel has been told to knock it off. You know, we said in no uncertain terms, uh, this is telling, apparently telling Advisor Jake Sullivan, um, who met with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, that he wants Israel to focus on how to save civilian lives um, and he, and find a way to, you know, wrap up this war. Uh, so Sullivan kind of flies there with his pants between his legs or his kind of tail between his legs. Uh, you know, asking, uh, but you're saying, please, sir, you know, could you maybe try and, you know, calm this down? Uh, and after, you know, they don't have a Sullivan Netanyahu affair. They have a Sullivan Gallant affair uh, with the 
uh, whatever defense minister, uh, the genocidal defense minister, Yoav Gallant. Um, and here's what he has to say <laughs> in the wake of what is supposedly a tough talk by Yoav, uh, by Sullivan to Yoav Gallant. This is what Yoav Gallant has to say with, by the way, just one of the most just, per, just awful sounding voices I've ever heard. So thank you for being side by side with us in this, in this effort. Uh, the Hamas is a terror organization that built itself for a decade to fight Israel. And they built infrastructure under the ground and on the ground. And uh, it is not easy to destroy them. Uh, it will take and require a long period of time. It will last more than several months. But we will win and we will destroy them. So thank you once again for coming to Israel, for helping us and for supporting us. And I'm looking forward to our meeting. So, so I mean, it's kind of hard to tell there, I think, whether, you know, I think Sullivan's eyes are just kind of, you know, boring into Gallant. They're just kind of standing side by side. And it's kind of a weird situation where Gallant is, uh, you know, almost like lecturing him on the camera. And, uh, you know, they're both facing the camera, but uh, Sullivan's head is pointed over and just he's kind of staring kind of impassively um, at uh, Gallant, who just, you know, he seems to be just like, okay, I guess we're doing this. Um, but, you know, Gallant is just saying, you know, we heard him uh, just saying, you know, <laughs> it'll last more than several months, but you'll be okay with it, right? You know, don't don't even bother answering that. You know, actually, we, don't, we know you'll be okay with it. Anyway, so really should give you in more appropriate sense of where the war is at. And, you know, by the way, if you think Biden's going to stop anytime soon with this, uh, you know, just march towards supporting Israel in any and every way possible. It's been, you know, one of the biggest parts of his whole career foreign policy wise, something he believes in deeply. Um, you know, you, you are going to be waiting a very, very long time. You know, you're going to be holding your breath uh, and uh, you might have to call the ambulance for you at a certain point. So uh, that is something to keep in mind. Uh, do not listen to these headlines. Um, and really, I think the fact that Biden is trying to pull the wool under people's eyes just makes him that much less qualified uh, to be a leader. So, to our next story now, we're with a pretty shocking report on, again, Al Jazeera reporting on the IDF storming of another hospital, this one called Kamal Adwan. We had mentioned that a little bit earlier. The IDF said it captured 70 Hamas fighters and collected weapons. Meanwhile, Al Jazeera reports that the hospital turned over the weapons used by hospital security. Every male over 15 was detained. And again, you know, uh, I think people getting mad at a hospital in Gaza, uh, I think for having security in a time like this, or really any time, I think is a little bit rich. Um, but again, this is what happens. Apparently, every male over 15 was detained in the weeks of the raid. The hospital was bombed and shelled by tanks. Nearly 100 people killed. They were buried in a mass grave, with nine out of the 40 hospitals in Gaza apparently remaining operational, and those are barely remaining operational. Here's some of the report. Well, Hani Mahmoud is live in southern Gaza in Rafah for us. So, Hani, first of all, uh, this raid on the uh, Kamal Adwan Hospital, what more are you hearing on that? Yes, Hazem, there are more disturbing reports, confirmed reports of Israeli military storming Kamal Adwan Hospital. It's important to point out Kamal Adwan Hospital is a mid-sized hospital, the only remaining health facility in the northern part. And within the past few days, it came under heavy bombardment and airstrikes and tank shell, destroying the vast majority of its facilities and all the major roads leading to it. Now, there are people who took it as a refuge, a shelter running away from the uh, uh, the airstrike, relentless bombardment in their neighborhoods. Now, we're talking about hundreds of people inside the hospital, including the medical team and those who were uh, brought as injuries and the patients in the in the hospital and hundreds other of evacuees inside the hospital. The disturbing reports, what we got from uh, Kamal Adwan Hospital, that the Israeli military on loudspeakers uh, ordering the administration of the hospital to hand in all the guns that the security personnel at the hospital uh, carry in order to protect the, the hospital. Uh, they were uh, collected by the Israeli military.
military. Now, there, anyone above the age of 15 was also ordered to start evacuating the hospital with their hands above their, their head. The Israeli military started to blindfold uh, those uh, men inside the hospital, round them up inside the court of the hospital. So far, the situations are very, very difficult for people inside. Just to give a broader picture of what happened over the past few weeks, the hospital came under heavy airstrikes and tension where a hundred, uh, almost a hundred people killed inside the courtyard of the hospital and the hospital resorted into digging grave, massive graveyard just to bury them because they could not take them outside uh, the hospital. This is not the first time hospitals are becoming under heavy attacks, but it's, it looks like it's a war not only on, on evacuation shelters, but also including hospital. We've seen a Shiva hospital, the Indonesian hospital uh, as well within the past uh, a few weeks. It's also important to point out only nine out of the uh, 40 hospitals across the Gaza Strip are remaining and operating at the low capacity possible in the central part and the southern part of the Gaza Strip. And this is the only uh, one remaining in that other one uh, in the northern part of the strip here. Important to say, um, really, really horrific situation that just again emphasizes uh, the continued attack on hospitals as some sort of strategy, and you know, not even necessarily, um, you know, anything other than uh, or just some sort, of, really, some sort of you know targeted effort because it is. What we've seen time and time again, Israel will tell you this, they've said this many times before, you know, every they know where every single bullet lands, they approve everything, um, you know, they were people who, you know, no problem assassinated someone like Rafat al like they, they knew what they were doing, every single person they assassinated, they have a you know, very clear idea of everyone who lives everywhere in Gaza, um, when they do stuff like this, this is really, you know, not an accident. And what they are targeting here is they are targeting what is the center of life uh, in Gaza at this moment. You know, as as much as it can exist, uh, it exists there. It's a meeting place. It's a place where people can get, you know, just basic essentials of living that they can't get anywhere else. Um, it is really, really important that they are able to find a, you know, especially in a place like the north. A safe place to go, and it's just something that they have really been uh, unable to find pretty conclusively here. Um, let's hear a little bit more of the report. Hani, uh, we heard as well about airstrikes at dawn today in Rafah. At least 20 killed, according to, to Palestinian uh, medical sources. What are you hearing? Well, this is another thing, Hazem, that keeps overwhelming health facilities across the Gaza Strip. More airstrikes means more death, more destruction, more displaced people. They end up going to hospitals seeking as a refuge. With the at dawn, earlier hours of this morning, a group of residential homes in the northern part of Rafah City, a supposedly safe area as designated by the Israeli military, came under heavy, a massive multiple airstrikes where a group of residential homes was completely destroyed. We're talking about uh, 23 people confirmed dead uh, so far and multiple other injuries. The number is expected to rise as still people searching under the rubbles and with with no equipment and, and, and little machinery available. People are using their bare hands to remove large pieces of concrete and cement just to get people from under the rubble. We're expecting the number to go up and this might take not only hours or days, uh, just a, a, an example of how we grave the situation, an attack that took place in, in mid-November. People were able to remove a bo deceased body from under the rubbles within the past two days. This is how long wow. it takes, given the difficulty. So, again, it's important. Like, again, think about how many you know, different people and how many people could have been saved, how many excess lives were lost, and how many people had to go through the absolutely unbearable, unimaginable experience of hearing their loved ones um, just dying when they could have easily you know, saved them had they had any sort of basic equipment, any sort of power. Um, you know, that has just been so long shut off from coming into Gaza. Um, yeah, so, of course, getting any kind of real support for Gaza comes from the West. Obviously, the West is the, you know, and when I say the West, you know, it's kind of obviously a euphemism for the United States. A kind of fig leaf the United States often does apply on itself to make it seem like, you know, oh, it has a whole direction, you know, of support. You know, like, that's how much support it has. It's kind of unstoppable. Like, but, you know... Uh, I think it is really, really clear that it, you know, if you see like the UN, 
uh, vote on the ceasefire. If you see how many times the you know U.S. has had to use its veto power on the Security Council in support of Israel, uh, I think it really makes clear where the true support lies. But um, it is really important, you know, what the Western audiences, uh, including the U.S., think and uh, the information that they get on the ground. Obviously, a big place they get this, and so one of the most you know pro-Israel audiences is CNN, and that's why it's so interesting uh, that the first really major Western journalists go in without, you know, on, not on an IDF embed, not having to put any sort of, uh, you know, run their footage back through the IDF because they were going with the IDF into Gaza. The first person to go into Gaza, she went with the IDF, uh, sorry, uh, Emirati medical team was Clarissa Ward, who's kind of the, the big wig CNN, uh, you know, Middle East war correspondent. Uh, she was going into Gaza, uh, and I, I think you know, it's very, very important to say and make very, very clear uh, there are journalists in Gaza right now who are just, you know, doing incredibly brave things. And they are the people who are the reason why we know anything that's going on in this conflict, get any sort of real sense of the daily lives of Palestinians, uh, whether it be, you know, Plestia, whether it be uh, Bisan, who I think believe, I believe is, you know, out of Gaza, but, you know, Motaz Asaiza. Um, what, you got all those kind of independent journalists. You got you just someone we just saw, Hamni uh, Mahmoud, uh, Yumna Patel. Um, I really, uh, Tariq Abu Azum, I believe that's his name. Yeah, Tariq Abu Azum, you know, Yumna Al Sayed, uh, two of the people who I remember, you know, just getting the, the chills and just like the, you know, just fear and just terror that I felt in my body listening to some, you know, Yumna Al Sayed in the first nights. Of October seventh, live on Al Jazeera English on the YouTube stream, uh, just coughing and having to wear a COVID mask from the white phosphorus Israel was already dropping down on Gaza. And of course, you know, Trik Abu Wazum from uh, mostly from the south south of Gaza uh, has kind of watched the fight come to him, which has been absolutely incredible work. But the point is, um, I think it is very very interesting to see, to see how someone like Clarissa Ward is going to re- you know, put this in a way that's going to be really, I think, more viewed not necessarily. By people in America, you know, she's not a household name by any means, but by people in D.C., especially kind of centrist people uh, and the the kind of D.C. out culture uh, and people who watch CNN and things like that, um, you know, the D.C. New York circuit of kind of upper middle class liberals, kind of the really core constituency uh, for Biden politically, uh, kind of giving a sense of this. It's going to be very, very interesting and important to see how they process this report. Uh, so she's going in a field hospital uh, through a field, uh, going with, going into a UAE field hospital uh, through the Rafa crossing. Let's listen. Strewn with trash and stagnant water, desolate and foreboding. So we've just crossed the border into southern Gaza. This is the first time we've actually been able to get into Gaza uh, since October 7th. And we are now driving to a field hospital that has been set up by the UAE. Up until now, Israel and Egypt have made access for international journalists next to impossible. And you can see why. Since October 7th, the Israeli military says it has hit Gaza with more than 22,000 strikes. That by far surpasses anything we've seen in modern warfare in terms of intensity and ferocity. And we really, honestly, are just getting a glimpse of it here. Despite Israel's heavy bombardment, there are people out on the streets. And they're showing, you know, Crowd complete destruction. Where else can they go? Nowhere is safe in Gaza. Used to be right. a stadium. Arriving at the Emirati Field Hospital, we meet Dr. Abdullah Al Nakbi. No sooner does our tour begin when. So our ambulance. That's real life. And this is what you hear all the time now? Yes. At least 20 times a day. At least 20 times a day. Maybe more sometimes. Uh, but I think we get used to it. One thing none of the doctors here have got used to is the number of children they are treating. The UN estimates that some two thirds. And again, I think it's really you know first of all right off the bat, it's just it is a completely unfiltered. It's not you know trying to in any way put. And I, uh, the funny thing is, pro-Israel people are already mad about this online. It's only been out I think for just today. Um, you know, talking about oh, citing UN statistics. How dare she? 
Uh, it was really kind of funny. But um, anyway, so just talking about the a the you know destruction. B just talking to the people. Just again, just, all it takes is just talking to people and getting a sense of what's actually going on for it to look absolutely horrific. Thirds of those killed in this round of the conflict have been women and children. Eight-year-old Janan was lucky enough to survive a strike on her family home that crushed her femur but spared her immediate family. She says she's not in pain, so that's good. And that's the mom. Her mother, Hiba, was She's out crying. when it happened. I went to the hospital to look for her, she says. And I came here, and I found her here. The doctors told me what happened with her, and I made sure that she's okay. Thank God. Little girl, femur just crushed. They bombed the house in front of us and then our home, Janan tells us. I was sitting next to my grandfather, and my grandfather held me, and my uncle was fine, so he is the one who took us out. But Even Dr. Ahmed Ward Al looks Mazraoui emotional says in this situation. it is hard not to. I work with old people, like uh, adults, but the children, something touching your uh, touches your heart and tests your faith. And they in show this humanity. boy with these just brutal facial injuries here. Jinan, Dr. Al Nakbi comes back with the news of casualties arriving from the strike just ten minutes earlier. They just got us. They will send right now two amputated uh, young uh, male uh, from uh, the, just the bomb. You from hear. the cusp we just yes. heard, from the bomb we just heard. This is uh, my understanding. Okay. They will arrive to our radio. Yes. 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 And the, yeah, a there's new amputees and a coming in. Boy are wheeled in. It's both a man and a 13 year old boy. Both in a perilous state. To us, man. To us, man. What's your name? What's your name? The doctor asks. The notes provided by the paramedics are smeared with blood. The tourniquet improvised with a bandage. Since the field hospital opened less than two weeks ago, it has been inundated with patients. 130 of their 150 beds are already full. So let me understand this. You are now basically the only hospital around that still has some beds? I guess so, yes. Or maybe I'm very sure of that because they are telling me uh, one of the hospitals with a capacity of 200, uh, they are accommodating 1,000 right now. And the next door hospital, I'm not very sure, he said like 50 to 200, uh, has maybe 400 to 500 patients. So at one occasion he called me, he said, I have three patients in each bed, please take any. I said, send as many as you can. I mean, we've been here 15 minutes, and uh, this is already what uh, we're seeing. This is, you hear it, you see it. In every bed, another gut punch. Less than two years old, Amir still doesn't know that his parents and siblings were killed. This is the boy in the strike that referencing disfigured earlier, him. just a yeah. massive scar on his face. Yesterday, he saw a nurse that looked like his father. His aunt Nahaya tells us he kept screaming, "Dad, Dad, Dad!" Oh. Amir is still too young to comprehend the horror all around him. But 20-year-old Lama understands it all too well. Ten weeks ago, she was studying engineering at university and helping to plan her sister's wedding. Today, she is recovering from the amputation of her right leg. Her family followed Israeli military orders and fled from the north to the south. But the house where they were seeking shelter was hit in a strike. The world isn't listening to us, she says. Nobody cares about us. We have been dying for over 60 days, dying from the bombing, and nobody did anything. Words of condemnation delivered in a thin rasp. But does anyone hear them? Like Grozny, Aleppo, and Mariupol, Gaza will go down as one of the great horrors of modern warfare. It's getting dark. Time for us to leave. 
a privilege the vast majority of Gazans do not have. Really just chilling stuff. She goes on to call that a window into hell that she had in that report. Um, and it really is just appropriately representing Gaza as what it is right now, which is just complete hell. Um, and bringing this picture to so many different people who normally would not have been exposed is just a massive, massive public service. That should definitely be highlighted. Um, also want to talk about today a really horrific story, and we just keep getting more and more of them coming out of Gaza at the moment. And here it is again with um, Al Jazeera and a report uh, just, you know, again, only witnesses at this time, but witnesses say they have found something just absolutely awful in a UN school. And, you know, there is footage of piled up bodies to begin to prove some of their claims. Al Jazeera has obtained footage of bodies piled up in a school in northern Gaza. Witnesses tell us that they were executed by the Israeli military. The dead include women and children. The Shadia Abu Ghazala school is a UN run facility that has become a shelter during this war but may now be the scene of a war crime. Rasul Sardar begins our coverage, and a warning, viewers may find some of the pictures in this report distressing. I cannot stand it. I cannot stand the sight, says this man, after seeing the gruesome scene in a school in Jabalia, northern Gaza. These are the bodies of people who had sought refuge at Shadi Abu Ghazan, a United Nations-run school. Witness says they were civilians, not fighters, killed execution style by the Israeli army. This woman's niece is among the victims. She was hiding from the bombardment here in the school building. We did not know where she was. Her mother, brothers, sisters and uncle were all killed. She says the killed, again, killed execution style. Like this is, this is just not even just, you know, completely comparable, if not exceeding some of the barbarities that we've seen. You know, again, if, if this is just proven in the way that it is, it 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 is beyond. It should again. There's just so many. There's just so many stories that are like this that should just in any just if there were anybody else would stop the whole world to a standstill and just make them feel you know just completely outraged. But again, this is a beyond. This is not even in every genocide. You know, do you have scenes that are this drastic and this dark? Like, this is just world historical stuff that will be known and just kind of, I feel like, is a household. Just again, people walking into. But again, you know, look at hidden history. We've seen stories and time and time again where there are instances where this happens where this is not known. And I think it is up to the people, like, you know, who are there in the moment who have, you know, voices to use, however small they may be, to point things out like this when they happen. I mean, there's, there's already been bodies that have been found there's already been, you know witnesses reporting just point blank execution style um, deaths of just you know people piled up high and it's all women and children men rounded up taken away israeli soldiers moving in shooting the rest of the families it is is just you know again I, I put the you know put the caveat there as a formality and I think it's, it's definitely you know important to investigate because at least that you know will be, bring more light to it regardless of whether it's true or not um, but it is just, it is, it it is, you know, and it, you know, by pretty much, there's no evidence that would in any way indicate that it isn't true. Um, you know, it, uh, there's obviously no super, you know, perfect confirm, confirmatory proof, but, uh, you know, that is the honest picture of where we are at the moment. Um, but it is, again, this is something that even, even if, you know, beyond where we're at the point we are at right now. Um, you know, this would have, it, had it happened in Ukraine, for example, it would have been front page news. Biden would have made a national statement on it. it, it like, it is just, like, it cannot be more clear, but it never, for some reason, never ceases to just, you know, blow my mind and amaze me how quickly and how fully Palestinian lives are just devalued and just, just downplayed when just, just world historically awful, awful stuff. Just, you know, atrocities beyond belief. Just the, the scene of just point blank execution of families sheltering inside a school. Displaced people. It just, it is, ugh, beyond belief. Beyond belief. Um, all right. We will, you know, move on now to kind of do a pretty tough heel turn, but a pretty interesting clip. Uh, this is by the way from journalist Arnaud Bertrone, um, who is um, 
you know, interesting kind of compiler of clips on Twitter. He says, uh, this is from Ami Alayon, former uh, Ayalon, uh, former head of Shin Bet, Israeli security service, and commander in chief of the Navy, um, talking about why October 7th happened and really analyzing just the general security situation, not really from a you know pro either side perspective, but from a pretty realist perspective, uh, taking a look at uh, you know motives, you know, and lack thereof, and you know why you know actors did what they did in the situation. Time uh, uh, and the first and probably most important is the political paradigm. Um, this is him now talking political about political paradigm. Um, was former head of Israeli that FBI. Since essentially, we cannot solve the conflict between us and Palestinians. Uh, all what we did failed. So the only way to do it now is uh, managing the conflict. So the policy was managing the conflict and uh, not to try to solve it. Uh, and um, in order to do it, uh, we had to do something which uh, we call divide and, uh, divide and rule, uh, meaning uh, we have to make sure that Palestinians will not have a unified leadership. Uh, to make sure that we should be always be able to say that nobody to talk with, nothing to talk about. And in order to do it, uh, we had to make sure that Hamas will go on controlling Gaza and, um, and the Palestinian Authority, uh, supported by Fatah, uh, will go on um, leading Palestinians in the West Bank. And they will create a conflict, you know, they, they will in a way, almost fight each other. And, um, and in order to do it, uh, we had to do what, all, all what we did, um, enhancing or assisting um, Hamas, uh, transferring money, uh, in a, in a, enabling people uh, to work in Israel, et cetera, et cetera. And our intention, we found ourselves strengthening Hamas and weakening Palestinian authority. Uh, once we did it... Um, Again, and just... And by the way here, very important to say, like, this is just the complete... You know, a former... Again, former head of Shin Bet, essentially admitting everything that we've said here on the show in the past. Um, you know, and, and I think this is, you know, important to bring up in the conversation. And if you happen to be listening to this, if you happen to be having, you know, a future conversation, you know, if you want to understand the situation better or if you do kind of get it, and know what's going on, uh, and you kind of need some more, you know, intellectual backing for the, you know, just broader situation, like, just know that this happened, you know, in the, uh, just transferring and assisting, uh, transferring money and enhancing and assisting of Hamas by Israel to create ads, <coughs> excuse me, Avi Avalon, or Avi Ayalon said, a divide and rule strategy where they could, you know, point to Gaza and say, Oh yeah, you know you want a Palestinian state. Well, we have the the PA over here. They're doing this, and we're giving them a little bit more, but also you know putting them in obviously as we see in Jadin, you know, completely awful situation. Uh, but with Hamas, we have no one to talk with, nothing to talk about. So it, like that is a situation that has created you know again it's talked about the paradigm. That is the paradigm. That is the existing state of affairs in which October 7th happens. And that is someone who's, that's not coming from, you know, Norm Finkelstein. This is someone who's coming, you know, from the heart of the Israeli security establishment, somebody who is honest about what's going on from the perspective of Israel and who is speaking in kind of a, you know, kind of closed forum uh, in a way that, you know, not many people are probably ever going to see, even as we talk about it here on this show. Um, and I think it's, you know, incumbent on the people who are listening to, it, to this to take this into their, uh, you know, the people who may hear this to take this into their understanding of the conflict because it's it's true. It's true. It's literally true. Um, you know, this is a really, really big part of the equation and it's a big part of the animosity that's been you know, kind of brewing up over time. And you know, as a result of all this, Hamas got, you know, the Palestinian support because they were actually being the people who are held up as this crazy opposition um, in this kind of Islamist opposition. But in facing uh, increasingly Israeli aggression, they were the only people who actually did anything to alleviate any of the pain, any of the suffering, and, you know, just show 
uh, any of the just the general humiliation that Palestinians face on a daily basis. So pretty much, you know, and neither of them could come close to PA or uh, Hamas could come close to touching Israel. So it was kind of a win-win situation for uh, for both of or for you know both kind of uh, outcomes for the Israelis. And um, what we saw on the Palestinian street that uh, Hamas um, is getting support, Palestinian support, because they became the only uh, group or, or, or administration. Because the PA had been effectively, you know, again, as he kind of says here, they've been effectively neutered. Uh, the other Palestinians uh, who fought against the Israeli occupation and uh, in order to achieve Palestinian freedom. PA had been brought into so, the Israeli um, occupation. On the other hand, um, Fatah and Palestinian Authority um, were perceived by Israeli collaborators because until today, uh, they refused formally to use violence. And um, although they are very weak, uh, they still are trying from time to time uh, to fight Palestinian terror, especially in Jenin, Nablus, wherever they can. They cannot do much because, as I said today, and this is a great change, big change from the 90s, uh, between 70 to 80 percent of the Palestinians are supporting uh, Hamas only because Hamas is perceived as the one who fight for its freedom. This paradigm led us to, um, uh, to a kind of uh, intelligence paradigm or understanding that uh, that Hamas is the third. Now, why Hamas is the third, by the way, the way I understand it, uh, in order to agree or to accept uh, this assumption, uh, you uh, it makes sure that you do not understand and you do not know what is Hamas all about. Um, because uh, the way I see it, we Israelis are measuring hardware and, um, and they measure software, meaning uh, what we measure after every round of violence or a military campaign, uh, we measure their losses uh, in, um, in human life, uh, in military installations and in military infrastructure. And um, on the other hand, what they measure, uh, they measure the support of the people, the support of the Palestinian street. Now, uh, this assumption that Hamas uh, is deterred was based on the idea that yes, on the twenty, on the twenty, uh, on the May twenty-one, uh, they suffered a huge loss and a huge military defeat. But on the other hand, we did not read the Halil Shkaki polls. And Halil Shkaki polls um, showed us a horrible picture in which it was the first time in which Hamas uh, got more than 50% of the Palestinian, of the support of the Palestinian people when Abu Mazen uh, became between 20 to 25% of the Palestinians. So every, after every round of violence after every military campaign we say okay from now abu mazen by the way is mahmoud abbas who is head of pa slash fatah on they are deterred for several years and they understand it as a huge victory and yeah that kind of last point about a very very interesting assembly that again a lot of palestinian people have been saying all along palestinian kind of pro-palestinian analysts have been saying all along and it's just another side kind of example of i think you know just who has the better handle on this you know situation just the the pro-israeli analysts who are just saying oh you know this you know we need to support this you know zionist regime for uh you know this reason and that reason it's good ally to have in the middle east you know just all the you know five different you know always recycled zionist talking points um but you know, the broader analysis of the situation um, that the Palestinian side is having is just being echoed here by the head of Israeli security. So, you know, if you're just looking for a side that just, again, to understand the situation better, uh, at least from an American context, in a Western context, uh, you know, that obviously includes Europe this time, um, it would be, I think very, very clearly, it would be uh, the Palestinians because, you know, they know what the Israeli state is doing, why it's doing it. 
And they, Israeli state is saying, yeah, you know, this is why we're doing it. And this is what we're doing. So, yeah, with that being said, it's a little time we got for you today. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to be back on Friday, which is actually today. So we'll see you very soon. It's News Flash.